love the message of that song. It fits with what I'm going to share today. So it's been almost three weeks. Two weeks in a row I was not here. I was here, but I didn't preach last Sunday. The week before that I was at uh, James Crabtree Correctional Center, uh, part of a Kairos weekend, and we were there uh, four days ministering. I was going to say ministering to the prisoners, but really God was ministering to all of us as the Holy Spirit just showed up there in a powerful way. And I, I don't know if I can even do justice to that to share it, but I would, I would like to. But uh, when I came in today, I thought this feels so awkward to me after two weeks that I almost signed the guest book. I didn't know um, where to start. In 25 years of ministry, I think I've only missed two weeks in a row one other time, and I'm not sure. I'd have to I'd have to go back and look, but not very many times. Um, but you know, a, a couple of weeks ago when we were at that James Crabtree Center, we were sit, seated at a table. Uh, there were three volunteers and six prisoners at every table, and uh, we didn't know their history. We didn't know their past. We didn't know what, why they were there. And I didn't want to know because I thought that might change my ability to love them in Christ. I didn't want to know what they did. Um, and I think as a church, I was thinking when I, uh, when I sat there, I thought that's where we need to be as a church. If somebody slides into our church, we shouldn't say, I'm, you know, I, I know their past. No, nobody should come up and say, Pastor, I know that lady's past. Or, or Pastor, I know that man's past. What we should say is, I know their Savior. I know their Savior, the one that can redeem them and change their life, and, and maybe already has. And, and so uh, the past uh, is something we probably all have. We all have some junk. The pastor at Hopeton Wesleyan said, if our life was a book, we would all have a couple chapters just titled Stupid. <coughs> you have any chapters of stupid in your life? Most of you are agreeing. You look for what you be at least in agreeing. But, uh, but you know, as I was there, and I have to admit, going into that prison setting, I was really kind of dry. I thought, Lord, I need a revival. I need a revival. What did you feel like to need a revival? Just go to prison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't know if that's for everybody, but... Uh, um, I thought, you know, this is something I'm going to go, and for four days... I'm going to pour into these prisoners. And I did that before I was a pastor. I was more involved in prison ministry than I was in church ministry. And, and yet, I found out through the years, when I really pour myself out for Jesus, He fills me up. That's when we really get filled up, is when we pour ourselves out. And, and it wasn't very long sitting there that I realized we're all just eating. We're all just sinners that need forgiving grace of Jesus Christ. But in the course of that weekend, there was one illustration that really touched my heart. And I couldn't get away from it. It's been two weeks, almost three weeks. It kept coming back. And I thought, I'm going to share this with my church and my prayer. And I hope you join me in this, that, that the Holy Spirit will take this and minister to you like it did me. I felt like it set me free. I felt like there's some stuff in my life that I just needed uh, to release once and for all. And so, uh, so I wanted to start out today making sure we're on the same page. I want you to talk back to me a little bit. There's nobody here but us. And uh, I don't have to encourage my wife. She talks back to me all the time. So, But the rest of you, I want you to talk back a little bit. Romans 3.23 simply states, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. All. The Greek word for all means all. Without exception. So would you say today, I'm a sinner. I have sinned. Can, can we admit that? Yes. Now, if anybody's struggling with that, then that's, that's a, an issue by itself because the only sin that God can't forgive is when we won't acknowledge that we have sin. 
But we've all sinned. So if somebody's walking by the church and said, I don't want to go in there, they all think they're holy rulers, that they're holier than us. The only difference is we found a solution for that sin. We found the answer, and it's in Jesus Christ. But I, I want you to really think about this. I want you to process it. Uh, so far, I, I think we've come to the conclusion every person except Jesus, who ever walked this earth, sinned. The greatest pastor you ever knew, the, the greatest saint in any church, sinned. Nobody was ever a, a shepherd or a pastor <clears throat> from the time they were born. They started out as a lost sheep before they became a shepherd. We're all in this together. There's no, there's no hierarchy in the kingdom of God except for Jesus Christ being the king. I want to quote some scriptures um, that I know you've heard before. Um, I want you to finish this sentence. This is John the Baptist. He saw Jesus coming to him, and, and John said this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, on that yellow card, I have that wrong. I have the sins of the world. But in John 1.29, and we may put that up on the, on the PowerPoint, John 1.29, I looked it up in... 28 translations and 28 out of 28 use the word takes away or removes and sin singular. I looked at a lot of commentaries, couldn't find out why, why that doesn't say sins and then when I wrote it down I, in my memory it should have been sins but 28 translations it was sin singular. I still don't have a real good answer. Most of the commentaries they would put comments on every verse. I'm like, yeah, I agree, I agree. Then the verse I'm confused on, they never make a comment. I thought, that didn't help me at all. You, you didn't have a good comment either. So I looked at Adams Clark. I looked at several of them and, and some from other traditions and, and uh, Henry's commentary. I looked at several and I thought, they skipped that verse. Why is that singular? You know, I kind of came to the conclusion, even looked it up in the Greek a little bit, it's, it's not so much our list of sins, but it's the condition of being sinful. The Lamb of God can take that sinful heart and change it and transform us. But also, I, I look at this and think, one time, He could do one sacrifice and take away, take away our sin. I looked that up in the Greek. It doesn't mean hide it. Or cover it up. Take away means that he picks it up and carries it away. He takes away our sin. Another place in Hebrews says that the, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away our sin. But the blood of Jesus can. The new covenant is so far superior to that old covenant. Um... And so several times in this, this little passage in, a, in John chapter 1, at least two times he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, I'm going to skip some notes here and I'm going to just have a prayer and ask God to bless the service. Father God, I pray that you would just bring this deep into our hearts, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come deal with each one of us on a personal level. Lord, I pray that you would, you would just touch our hearts. That we would understand why you came, why Easter happened as we are on the brink of Easter, Lord, as we look more into the cross and what you did, that the, the purpose to take away our sin. Lord, I pray that your spirit would go further than I could possibly go, that you would minister to us. In Jesus' precious name. So I want to ask a question again. I want a response. 
<clears throat> Would you agree Jesus came to take away our sins? You agree with that? Yeah. Just nod your head. Um, you know, it's, it's to take upon oneself, to carry away. Um, I, I want to get that image in my mind going into Easter, that Christ came, Christ came even at Christmas, the baby came to take away our sin and died on that cross to take away the biggest problem in our life, and that is sin. So I wanted to ask the question, do most of you believe Jesus died on the cross, He shed His blood to take away your sin? Most of you personally say, I've accepted Christ as the atonement for my sin. I see a lot of heads nodding. He came to forgive me of my sin. Pastor? Yes. I'd like to think of that as he came to take away sin, period. Period. Yeah. That's where I want to go. He came to take away sin, period. My sin, your sin, everybody's sin. So, uh, so I you know I've asked. Have most of you asked Jesus to forgive your sins? I hope you have. Um, now I'm going to stop preaching a little bit. And I'm going to start praying just a little bit. There's a difference. Not praying, praying. And I hope the Holy Spirit's in this. Um, out there in our world, there's a lot of hurting people. People that have no hope. People that have had chapters of stupid in their life. People out there just like us when they haven't found the solution of Christ. He came to erase that junk in our life to, to take our mess and make it a message. He came to give us hope when we are hopeless. You know, we've all heard the saying, God helps those who help themselves. My grandmother used to say that. That's not in the scripture. God helps those who can't help themselves. We can't take away our own sin. We can't. The old Jewish system couldn't do that. Only Jesus could do that. And you know, John 3.16 mentions that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. From that phrase, could you say that God loves every person here? God loves the people we have a hard time getting along with. You know, you can't hate anybody that God doesn't love. <laughs> I want you to think about that. God so loved the world. And I think about love, and you go to, to a chapter in 1 Corinthians, it talks about love. And on that list it says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. I believe that God so loved the world, once He forgives us, He doesn't keep a record of our wrongs. Do you agree with that? He wipes that out, that record's gone. Sometimes we come back and, and we feel guilty over something. We come back and we say, Lord, forgive me again for what I did back there five years ago. And, and He says, what? What'd you do? I didn't keep a record of that. He takes away our sin. Bear with me, I'm trying to follow... But I feel like the Lord's wanting me to share here <clears throat> that God came, and I hope you're still in agreement, God sent His only Son to forgive anybody that would ask Him. Anybody. Take their sins away. Keep no records of wrong. And, uh, and so I think, so why isn't everybody saved? If God came for the whole world and He loved the whole world, why isn't everybody saved? Did God choose that some would perish and that some uh, would be saved for eternity? Let me read it. From 2 Peter 3, 9, just one place. It said, The Lord is not slow concerning His promise, as some counts slowness, but He is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's the key word, repentance. It's God's will that everybody would repent and they'd find that forgiveness, and they'd find that joy, and they'd join us. We're the redeemed sinners, and the only difference is we found that redemption. So God loved the whole world. He has the power through Jesus to do what no other sacrifice can do, to take away the sin 
of the world. And this same God says the road to hell is wide and easy. And many will be on it, but the road to heaven is difficult and narrow, and few will be on it. So here's the kicker. One of many places I can read to you, and this one's in Isaiah concerning the entire nation of Israel. It says, For, for thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, In repentance and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing. God's willing. God's willing to save anybody. And the worst, most corrupt person you can think of, God's willing to save. And, and uh, I'll tell you, as I sat at that table, we were not to ask these prisoners what crimes they committed, but once in a while one would volunteer. One man had said to my right that I got pretty close to in a four-day event was serving a life sentence. What started out as a practical joke took one of his friend's lives. For 27 years he'd been in prison. And one of the statements he made is it only takes about three seconds to earn a life sentence. He had ulcers. He had an ulcer so bad, in fact, they had, they had removed part of his stomach, part of his colon. He had serious problems because every single day he was feeling the guilt of what he did when he was 17. Now, I'm not saying he should be set free from prison or whatever. I, I was thinking, you know, there's consequences. There are consequences to sin. And I asked him, I said, did you ever ask the Lord to forgive you? And he said, how many days are in 27 years? And I said, I, I don't know. I can't do the math that quick. He said, probably three times a day I've asked Jesus to forgive me for the stupid thing I did that took another man's life. Another 17-year-old kid's life. A little town of 500 people, one senior died. Second day of their senior year, one senior died, and two of them went to prison. One for life and one for 30 years. A town of 500 people. You can imagine the impact that had on that town. And up here, the, the young man can say, I know God has forgiven me, but, but, but. You know, I, I think about that. People are not willing sometimes to accept the power of the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. People are missing out on so many blessings simply because they won't surrender to God. His will is that every person would be saved. Every person. My neighbor, the people that I love, the people that are hard to love, it's God's will that they'd be saved. And, and not everyone is willing. Parents cannot make their kids willing. Spouses cannot make the other spouse willing. Sometimes it's the other way around. Kids cannot make their parents want to accept Christ. But Joel 2.32 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10.13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Does that mean everybody that asks is forgiven? Doesn't it? If we ask God for forgiveness, He forgives us. How soon does that take place? Is it instant? How many times do you have to ask God to forgive you for something before it's forgiven? One time. Now I have several more verses where it says everyone or anyone that calls on the Lord will be saved. Anyone who repents of their sin will be saved. But what if it's a really horrible sin? What if it's murder? Can Jesus forgive that? What if it's adultery? Can Jesus forgive that? What if it's greed or hatred or racism? Can 
Jesus forgive them? What about drunkenness, addiction, drug use, prostitution? The list goes on. But isn't it true that God can forgive all of that? First John 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does that apply to anybody who will confess their sins? In Hebrews 8.12 it says, I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Now people might remember our sins, but God doesn't. Isaiah, I'm skipping a lot of these. So though your sins may be as scarlet, Isaiah 118, they shall now be as white as snow. In Micah, kind of an obsolete little book, in Micah 7, verse 19, it said, You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot, and you will hurl all our iniquities into the depths. You know, we've taken that and we can sing about it sometimes. The sea of his forgetfulness. You tie some of those verses together and it's easy to get there. When we ask God to forgive us, our sins are forgiven. So I'm going to ask again. Once you repent, once you turn from sin and ask for forgiveness, that's really what repentance is. Your sins are completely gone, right? If the Bible's true, they're gone. Now I'm going to meddle. How many of you have asked God for forgiveness more than once for the same sin? Some kind of trigger comes up and we feel that guilt and shame as if we've never repented and we feel burdened and we come back and we say, oh God, forgive me again. Does that come from God or is that coming from the very pits of hell? I think that is Satan trying to tell us that it's not just one time of repentance. Once and done, God forgives us. Now I think we can mess up again. We have to come back again and say, Lord, forgive me for this new sin. But Satan wants to remind us of our past. He wants to beat us up with our past. And you might say, but preacher, you don't know the horrible things I've done. But listen, folks, you're not the worst sinner. In the kingdom of God, you're not. There was this guy named the Apostle Paul. He said, Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. He was the worst one, so we, we could be second, maybe. But he said, I am chief. But that's why Christ came. That's why he died on the cross. That's why we celebrate Easter. Because Jesus Christ can take our sins away. The Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. You know, I think guilt and shame is a gift from God in its right place. But once we have given that to Christ and it's under the blood, we have no business going back under the blood and digging it up again and feeling guilt and shame again for what Christ has already died for. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? I handed out pieces of paper there and I don't know if everybody got one. If not, there's some up here and some pins up here. But I have made the mistake there to put plural on the sins of the world. It's the sin of the world. It's your sin. It's my sin. Jesus Christ took us and became sin for us and died on the cross. I want you to search your heart a little bit and, and say, what do I need forgiveness for? Maybe it's one of those things that triggers come up. 
And on the other side, we get to the Lord's Prayer again. It says, And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. How many of you have thought you forgave something? You thought you forgave it, and then something triggers it, and you're just as angry at that person as you was. As, I, there's some things I avoid because it triggers anger that I thought I had forgiven. Sometimes I went five years thinking I had forgiven anger, a situation that something would trigger. But I want to tell a story here, and I want you to be praying. You can go ahead and write. You can write um, things I need to forgive this for, and the flip side of that is people I need to forgive. And you know what was at the top of my list on people I need to forgive? Self was at the top of my list. That's who I'm the hardest on. Myself. And you know, some people in that prison setting, they had 30 names or more. You don't have to put names. You can put initials. Same thing over here on things I need forgiveness for. You can put CC1988 church camp. You know what you did. Or, you know, whatever. You don't have to have something that I would understand. But if you want to put initials there, something that I keep going back and digging up again, that one thing that I can't seem to get victory over. And people I need to forgive. I had an evangelist friend. Remember when they used to do revivals and preachers would come and spend, spend a week or two weeks doing services in a tent sometimes. I had a friend that did a lot of that. He said one particular time there was a lady there and she was just bitter. And he had known her from college. And she was the sweetest thing in college. And, and he said she was just bitter. She would say, your sermon was so dry, it needed humor. The next time she said, you were just silly tonight. I didn't come here for a comedian. Your sermon was too long, it was too short, the music was too loud, it was too quiet. Every single thing that went on, she was critical. And, and he had known her pretty well in college, and he was in his 60s. And he called her to the side one night in the foyer, and he said, I just have to ask you. Are you angry at God? Now I want to tell you right now, I don't think I don't think that God ever owes anybody an apology. That God's never done anything unrighteous. He's never sinned. But sometimes in our heart we have to say from our human understanding, Lord, I don't, I don't understand it, but I've been angry at you and I want to let go of that. Her story was life didn't turn out the way she thought it should. She had one child. Couldn't have any more. And then that child was called in college to be a missionary, and that made her bitter. I only have one kid, and you're taking him to foreign soil. And I would think as a parent, we would celebrate that. God's using my, my son so committed to Christ. And then he died in the mission. She never got over that. She still went to church. Maybe still headed to heaven, but the joy of the salvation was gone. And and so it could even be a situation like that. Say, Lord, I'm going to give it up. I don't understand it. But I have a God that I can trust. I don't know what kind of stuff is in your life, but I have about four names on people I need to forgive. And the biggest bold print is self. i got to let go of some stuff. But the story was told I probably did this out of order, but the story was told of a, of a farm man who, who had a rooster. This, this man had a rooster that he loved, and you see there's a little rooster there on that paper. But he had a rooster that he loved, and, and you might laugh at this, but how many of you have ever had chickens? That's a bigger percentage than I thought. We had a, uh, you know, every time it happens, I go out there and I hear the chirping, my eyes light up, and I think, I need to buy a couple of baby chickens, and my wife says, no, come on, let's go. Get your popcorn, let's get out of here. But I took home three or four one time. Just lately, living over here in the Country Club Edition, I took home some chickens. And I don't know if we had three or four, but they didn't stay yellow and fuzzy very long. They got bigger, and 
one morning we heard this horrible, horrible noise, and there were three of them that turned into roosters overnight. <laughs> and they didn't know how to crow at all. And they kind of like me singing. That's what it sounded like early in the morning. And, and when I said, they got to be gone today. And so we called the Binghams, and they took our three roosters. But there was a little red hen that went with that group, too. We got rid of her. But my mom got the biggest kick out of that little red hen because if she went outside, and she went outside to do devotions, and that little red hen would jump up in her lap and want to pet it. They, they could socialize with people. And this, this man had this rooster that he got very close to, and he, he took it to the, to the county fair, and he won the county fair, and he took it to the state fair, and it won the state fair. But it was more than that. He really liked and this same farmer had a son that worked hard and did a lot of things for him. And, and one Monday, this son came home from school, and the dad was standing in the barn kind of watching. And there was a bright red sports car in that farmyard. The dad thought a pickup would be more practical, but you're only young once. The, this bright red sports car was there. That son walked around it, and looked in the window, and, and he looked over at his dad, and his dad was smiling. And the son said, Dad, whose car? And he said, Son, it's yours. Why don't you take it to town and give some of your friends a ride and I want you home by sundown. And so the kid jumped in that car and threw a little dirt as he went out the driveway and, and he went to town and he gave his friends a ride and they rode around and he realized it's getting darker than I thought. I better get home after Dad did this for me. And, and so he came home faster than he should have come and he, he pulled in the driveway and he, he turned up the driveway and that rooster jumped up in front of that car It was dead. He had to pull it out of the grill. And his dad was sitting on the porch and saw the whole thing. And he cradled that dead rooster and he walked up to his dad. Tears were going down his face and he said, Dad, you've done so much for me. And I can't believe I let this happen. I was careless. I was reckless. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And and the dad, the dad said, son, I, I hate it that that happened. But son, I, I forgive you what's done is done. You see, what happens sometimes when we think about forgiveness is we think we have to say what you did was okay. It wasn't okay that that rooster got killed, but he could still forgive. Some things in your life will never be okay, but we have to forgive other people's sins. If we want our sins forgiven. In fact, Matthew 6, 14 says, If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive other people their sins, your Father will not forgive you. But this Father was a great example of, of God the Father. He was disappointed when he said, Son, I forgive you. Now, now bury that rooster under that, that oak tree up the driveway there. The son went and got a shovel and he buried the rooster. That was Monday. Tuesday went by with no events, and on Wednesday, the son came home from school at sundown with his shiny red car that his father had blessed him with, and he saw that rooster's grave there. And he saw his dad sitting on the porch, almost asleep, and he thought that rooster was usually in his dad's lap. And he was overwhelmed with grief and guilt. Sorrow. And he went into the garage, the tool shed, and he got the shovel out and he dug that rooster back there. It's been a couple days. And he pulled it out and it stunk a little bit and he shook it against his leg and got the dirt off of it. And he went back up and his dad kind of woke up and he's standing in front of him holding that dead rooster. Tears streaming down his face again. And he said, Dad, I'm so sorry that I killed your rooster. And his dad said, son, I already forgave you for that. What are you doing with that, that stinking bird? What are you doing? Take it back and bury it again. It's okay. We're good together here. We have reconciled. You have peace with me. Go bury that person. That was on Wednesday. The rest of the week went okay until Saturday. And the kid came back from town and he's saw that grave, and his dad was in the barn this time at the grinder sharpening lawnmower blades, and he went to the tool shed, and he grabbed that shovel. 
And you're probably thinking, that stupid kid is not going to dig that rooster up again. But don't we do that? How stupid is that? I want you to write down here people or things, situations you need to forgive. <clears throat> and things I need forgiveness for. Then I'm going to ask you as we close today that you would come and symbolically we're just going to put these in this planter and we're going to cover them with dirt. But I don't want you to do it unless you mean it. I'm going to leave it here. Here at the cross. I'm going to give this to the Lord. I'm going to bury it. I believe what the Bible says that if I confess my sins, He will remember it no more. I'm, I'm going to say what Satan says to me. Remember when you did that 30 years ago? I'm going to say I'm not digging up that rooster. I'm not digging up that rooster. And when Satan reminds me of somebody else that hurt me, I'm going to say, Lord, that's, that's under the blood too. I'm not digging up that rooster. And so I'm going to give you a chance. We're going to um, try to play some music, but just as you will come, and I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will move you to do that. There's nobody, nobody here but us. But if you have something you'd like to give up forever today, now's your chance to do that. We're going to give a few minutes.
but it, it'll be here. We'll stay as long as you stay. But after, after it's done, I'm going to carry these things away. I'm not going to look at any of them. They're between you and God. But Jesus carried away our sins. You'll never see that piece of paper again. It's gone. We're going to sing a celebration song. Why Christ came, why what he did for us, and I'm going to ask the music people to lead us in that. Stand, please, as we sing this old, old song together. Hymn number 251, verses 1 and 2. Once it seems so Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.